I live in a relatively large county in southwestern Virginia, and there's a lot of old rundown buildings and shacks that are usually unlocked and relatively safe to enter. I mean this as in the buildings still have some support to keep the house from caving in. It was the middle of summer, and being the edgy teenager I was, a few friends and I decided to go to an abandoned house that was just on the cusp of the wood line next to our houses. The neighbourhood this took place in always made me feel off. I've had some really weird experiences there, and had only lived there just shy of six months. I get my trusty book knife, my buddy, and his sister's boyfriend, and we go toward the house. There's a small field before you get there, and the grass is never cut, so we have to take our time and tread lightly, so we wouldn't get bit by snakes that are passing through. But with every step, I felt heavier and heavier. It felt like maybe I should back, but I didn't want to be a wuss and my buddy and HSBF. I don't feel like writing it, you get the gist. We're having fun and joking about it. So I played along. We eventually get to the house and I hadn't been touched in years. I emphasize years because there were boxes full of newspapers from the late 60s and early 70s that were still in place as if the owner had just decided to up and leave. We start looking around and are just screwing around, doing what teenagers do, when we all stop and look at each other. I don't know why we all thought to do that. It seemed like they were waiting for something. My buddy cracks a joke and we all just go back to what we were doing. We look around some more and found an old Bible that was read regularly, a couple of broken glasses and a shattered picture of a couple that was in black and white. I noticed it and wanted to take a look, but when I reached down to it, we heard a quiet whisper of a get out. We thought we were psyching ourselves out, so we continued on. But now I'm sure not to have a thought of touching something. And we opened the door to what I presume to be the bedroom. It looked like someone had stripped all of the flooring. After the door, it went straight to dirt. No floor, subfloor, anything. And then we look up and see a noose hanging from a beam from the ceiling. It scared me shitless. We didn't have a word to say. We all looked at each other and I shut the door. We didn't want anything to do with that room. The building was a two-story house and the stairs were still intact. But we noticed that there was shattered glass and blood on the steps. We started to get really freaked out at this point. But I decided to try to walk up the steps. And that's when I saw an old mason jar shatter in front of me. And a quiet whisper behind my ear that said in a low, menacing tone, Leave now. I run my chubby ass out the door with the, my friends following closely behind. I hightailed it out through the field. I didn't even care about the snakes. We meet up at the end of the field at the edge of the road and we look back at the window and we see an apparition slowly disappear at the front door. Me and my friends made a promise to never ever set foot there again. And we haven't since. It's been six years since this occurred and we're still friends. We joke around about it now, even dubbing the Kent House Ghost our road name. But I still get chills when I think about the words, leave now. So I'm living in the house that I grew up in, and this has happened for years, and I've just always brushed it off. But until my wife brought something up about it, I thought I was crazy. So the house is a two-story country home, built in 1973, and it's only had three owners, my great-grandfather, my mother, and myself. So no way is there a fact that someone who we didn't know passed away there. The only death that has ever occurred in this house was my great-grandfather in 2005, who died in the room I sleep in from lung cancer. I was always terrified to stay in my room when I was younger for one particular reason. The door would always slam shut if it was cracked or fling open when it's halfway open. Let me give you backstory. My great grandfather always hated doors not being one way or the other. You either have them opened or closed, no in between. I barely knew the man, so I couldn't tell you why this is. So I feel as if it's him doing this, but I couldn't be sure. Another weird thing is that a main air duct is located behind one certain door in the main hall that lets much of the heat or AC in constantly opens as if someone wants to use the heat or AC they're paying for. And this will happen at random. 
if it's on or off, day or night. And the weird thing is, it doesn't just fling open. My wife and I have both observed the doorknob turn and open, as if someone's opening it. It's crazy and I'll have to try and record it. The final thing that's weird is that my basement door, which has a slide lock and a door lock on it, in which I double check every night to make sure it is locked, constantly opens in the middle of the night and I can hear it creak open, weirdly, in my dreams occasionally. I see him in my dreams, but I have no idea what's causing all of this. My name is Nancy Poitou. A colleague referred this case to me. In this case, there was an apartment building where there was a mother and daughter who lived in a loft. The daughter woke up one night to see a black man standing over her bed. The little girl's mother told her therapist, who told her about me, and she told the apartment manager. The therapist gave her client my contact information, and she passed it on to the apartment manager. By this time, the mother and daughter had both moved out. Oddly enough, the date I was asked to do my ghost busting thing landed on Halloween. I asked a friend of mine to come with me, as I usually do someone who's intuitive and spiritual to do with this with particular ghost busting events. The apartment manager had done some research and discovered that the building was very old, and many years ago it was a courthouse and jail. I appreciate any information that I'm given about the police I'm investigating, because I'm not out to prove anything to anyone. I just want to help the people who live there and the ghost or ghosts as in this case. My friend Maria and I got there and met with the apartment manager, who took us up to the loft. When I walked in, I quickly realized it wasn't just one ghost, but closer to a dozen, which surprised me. I said this to the apartment manager and asked if she wanted to say. Her response was something like, oh, hell no. I laughed and she took off. I was taught to never, ever be afraid in these situations. If the entities are negative, they will feed off fear. When I go to do ghost busting, my intention is to help all those living and dead to find peace. I find that when come in this intention and energy, I don't encounter any problems, at least not so far. So the first thing I used to do is investigate, meaning walking around the property in an altered state and see what I pick up while my friend does the same. She agreed there were more than one and probably a dozen ghosts inhabiting the space. What I saw in my mind's eye was that we used to call hobos. Hobos were men who were homeless, especially during the Great Depression, and who rode the railroads by covertly hitching a ride in the 30s and 40s. As a young girl, I remember warnings from my mother to stay away from the railroad tracks. I didn't understand why at the time, but my mother who lived through the Great Depression as a young girl knew about hobos. Just like today's homeless, there are some who can present a danger. I much later realized mom wanted me to avoid hobos. One definition of hobo is a migrant worker or homeless vagrant, especially one who is impoverished. The term originated in the western, probably northwestern United States around 1890. Unlike a tramp who works when only forced to, and a bum who does no work at all, a hobo is a traveling worker. Along with the dozen or so hobo ghosts in the former jail, was also a policeman. I could see the jail cell and the hobos in, in the policeman all talking, telling stories and joking. I was surprised to find that it did not seem like a prisoner guard relationship that I would normally expect. It seemed more friendly and informal almost, like the guard was there to supervise rather than guard dangerous prisoners. Because the dozen or so hobos were earthbound spirits, it occurred to me that although possible, it was unlikely that they all died there. The apartment manager who did some research did not mention any events that would have resulted in them all dying there at the same time. But for some reason, it seemed to me they came back. Perhaps because it was a friendly, warm environment in what must have been some pretty depressing lives. Many years later, I learned that back in the 30s and 40s, police departments would open their jails for these hobos to have a warm place to sleep and a meal. I didn't know this at the time I was visiting this loft, which is why I was somewhat confused by the energy of the relationship being so friendly. Once I determine what's going on in a location, I then attempt to communicate with the ghosts or earthbound spirits. 
Until I'm shown otherwise or experience otherwise, I assume that the souls that are stuck in a place between our physical plane and the next, which ghosts or earthbound spirits. An earthbound spirit is a soul that has died and in some cases doesn't know what they doesn't know that they have died. Sometimes earthbound spirits have died under very traumatic circumstances. They're scared and confused and are unable to perceive the light, and so are unable to make their way into the light and get to the portal to the other side. What earthbound spirits need in these cases is someone to help them find the light, the path to the other side. Sometimes they need to tell their story, and that alone can release them from being stuck between worlds. Some earthbound spirits are just unwilling to move on to the next place for one reason or another. Sometimes it's a guilt, a horrific loss, a traumatic death, or simply being very attached to a place. Souls don't always stay at the place where they died. They sometimes go back to a place where they have good memories or where an important life event or good or bad happened. This was my conclusion about the hobos. The energy felt camaraderie and acceptance. My next step is to go into an altered state to communicate with the ghosts. There seems to be no re reason other than the camaraderie and positive feelings they had about each other and the location that drew them back here and was keeping them there. My friend Mar Maria did a ritual to open a portal I laid down on the cement floor and went into an altered state. I think of it as entering into their space. I think they telepathically know I'm there to help because I usually encounter very little resistance. I communicated with the policeman who was wearing an old fashioned police uniform with the kind of hat that was flat on top with multiple straight edges around it and a shiny brim in front. I mentally explained that they seemed stuck there and told the policeman that I was there to help them move on. I then asked him to lead the way through the portal. He hesitated, saying that these men were his responsibility, and he, he went first. He was not sure they would all follow him. So I said, okay, and have them go through the portal first, so you can make sure that they all go through before you step through. So the policeman told the hobos to line up. I was surprised that they were so compliant and got on a single file line, each one pausing his right and on the shoulder of the person in front of him. I mentally asked them to look for the light and directed their attention to where Maria opened the portal. I said it may look small at first, but keep your eyes on the light and it will get closer and closer. And so in a line, they began to walk through the portal. And lastly, I saw the policeman follow. It's at that point that the spirit guides and loved ones of the earthbound spirits can then take over, guide them into the afterlife. Having been a hospice volunteer, I've seen people have deathbed visions where guides and relatives who have passed on before them come to get them. But sometimes in the case of the earthbound spirits, their vibration is too low for them to see the light. Spirit guides, friends and relatives. That's where the need for someone like me comes in so that I can get them to a point where they can now see the spirits who are there or at the portal. My next step in ghostbusting is now to remove any negative energy and to raise the vibration of the place. So first I use a smudge stick, which is a Native American tradition to remove negative energy. It's made up of dried and bundled sage, in some cases sage and cedar. You light the end of it with a lighter, allowing it to burn for about 30 seconds, and then you blow out the flame and it keeps smoking. As a white person, I use a turkey feather to direct the smoke. Native Americans use, these other, use other kinds of feathers, like eagle feathers, which are not only to be used by Native Americans. I use the feather to direct the smoke of the burning sage as I walk around the house or apartment, or in this case, the loft. Since there were no furnishings, I focused on walking around the inside wall, smudging as I go. The next step in removing negative energy is the use of unrefined salt. I sprinkled a little salt along the inside walls of the loft. The salt will soak up any remaining negative energy and needs to be vacuumed up in a couple weeks. My next step is to raise the vibration. This is like changing the energetic address. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. I do this by first burning incense. This is what keeps earthbound spirits from returning to the place. 
I use resin, incense, and again use a turkey feather to direct the smoke of the incense around the inside of the walls. There are other things one can be used to raise the vibration like classical music, spiritual symbols and photographs or artwork of positive spiritual images or people. Another step is to use the frankincense oil. I have a little jar which I'll dip my finger into it and say a blessing over the doors and the windows, making a cross with the frankincense oil. I sometimes leave behind a copy of the prayer of protection. But in this case, because the loft was uninhibited, I only used the incense, the frankincense oil and meditation. In the meditation, I say the prayer of protection and visualize a white light enveloping the domicile. I also usually use a white candle the kind that is in a tall jar. I anoint it with frankincense oil and light it while saying the prayer protection. But again, because this place was empty, I didn't want to leave a burning candle. If it's an occupied home, I'll give the occupants instructions about vacuuming up the salt and letting the white candle stay lit until it's burnt all the way to the bottom and goes out on its own. I instruct the occupants that when they leave the house to put the candle in a shower or bathtub, where even if it's knocked over, it won't start a fire. Allowing the candle to burn down to the bottom continuously, I don't want the ritual to be broken. So rather than have it broken, I didn't in this case use a white candle. Marie and I did the meditation. The more people who join in, the more power it has. So when there is an occupant, I will also involve them in the meditation. When I do a ghost busting session like this, I offer a money back guarantee. The reason I do this is because I want to know if what I'm doing is working or not. And as I said, in the beginning, my intention is to help both living and dead. And if I haven't been able to help them, I don't think they should have to pay for it. The next day, I spoke with the apartment manager and told her what had gone on and what I discovered. I told her about the money back guarantee and if there were any more problems to please call me. She assured me that she would. It's been years and I haven't heard from her, so I wouldn't say it was a success. I couldn't think of a better way to spend Halloween than just do some real life ghost hunting. One day, I was sitting in my living room to the right of where I was sitting is the door that leads to the kitchen. All I had to do was lean forward to look into the kitchen and I could see through the kitchen to the back door. I was also able to see in the opposite direction, the front door. So I'm sitting there and I hear the back door open and close. I lean forward and look, but I see nothing. I hear footsteps that sounded like men's boots. As usual, rather than visually see something, I see it in my mind's eye. What I saw this day was a cowboy. He walked straight from the back door through the dining area, through the kitchen and stopped at the doorway right next to where I was seated. It felt as though we sort of looked at each other and shrugged. Okay, I said to myself, that just happened. And then he continued to walk through the living room and I heard the front door open and close. Neither the back door nor the front door moved, but I know the sound of my own back door and my own front door when they open and close. My house is not haunted and this had never happened before or since. From knowing the history in the city I live, the area where my house is was a very long time ago, the red light district. So it's my conjecture that this cowboy was looking for the brothel. When he didn't find it, he just kept on walking. It seemed obvious to me, or it felt to me like he could see my house and he could see me and was somewhat confused as I was in the moment. I was taught to never be afraid of ghosts because if they were negative entities, they would feed off the fear. I've never been afraid, startled maybe, but never afraid. So this is just one of those things that happened that was interesting, but I was not the least bit frightened or upset. It was just a day where a spirit walked through my house looking for the brothel. When I was 10, I woke up and saw a lady watching me. I was on the top bunk. I could only see shoulders up. She had long blonde hair and was wearing a blue pink dress. She had a neutral expression. She looked like she was painted on a cell phone. I tried to scream and nothing came out. She disappeared and I jumped out of my bed and ran really fast downstairs. My parents got out photo albums and asked if I saw her in any of them. 
I didn't. They said not to be afraid. Seeing people who have died is a gift. I said I didn't want it. They heard of a local lady who had the gift. They arranged a meeting. Sounds like a good idea. Oh my god, she scared the shit out of me. Eventually, as I got older, the lady was very helpful. The reason I share my experience is my parents didn't call me a liar. Instead, they had me meet with someone to help me understand what was going on. I had my first and only migraine hit while my rescue parrots thought it was a good time for all of them to vocalize. Screeching at the top of their lungs. I kept asking them to stop, but they wouldn't. There were about six here at the time. I had to sit down because I feel like I was going to vomit. My house has a history of unusual activity. I said, okay, if someone is really here, please make them stop. I can't take it. Within seconds, total silence. Such relief. I said thank you. The parrots actually remained quiet for the rest of the day. A friend said she would have run out of the house, lol. Side notes, all those up for adoption have been adopted and living their best bird lives. If it's okay to add another story as to why I believed someone was here. It only happened to family and close friends who were here a lot. Sometimes when using the bathroom, the door wouldn't open no matter how hard you tried. It was like it was cemented closed, no give at all. Well, until you said please out loud, the door would open easily. It was so funny the first time it happened to someone. At least they locked us in instead of out. So they weren't cruel, lol. But this is why I asked if you are here, please stop the birds. It's nice to have a friend, even if I can't see them. I think my animals see whoever it is, but the animals aren't afraid of them. When I was 14, I was riding my bike down the street on which I live and was going past my neighbor's house. It's a small single wide trailer and used for selling drugs and other bad stuff. Nobody actually lives there except for the dealer, but people visit all the time to buy and sell. I always sped past his house because these people creeped me out, but this time nobody was home, so I didn't need to hurry. I glanced over at the trailer and saw a cute girl on the patio porch that was added on. She waved at me. I waved back and that was that. A few weeks later, I saw the girl in the yard of the neighbor's house and she looked over at me and waved again, this time with a smile that just stuck with me. My brother was knelt right next to me, trying to get a go-kart started. So I asked if he knew her name and if she lived in the trailer. He had no idea who I was talking about, which didn't surprise me because I figured he was preoccupied and didn't see her. I didn't see her again for three years, and by then I rarely thought of her. So by this point of the story, I'm 17, or nearly 17, I'm not sure. And at my other neighbor's second house, he owned two, a real nice two-story and trailer right next to that one. The neighbor I'm currently talking about, let's call him R. Let my family use half his property for gardening. It's late summer and the garden is in full bloom. I'm checking the cucumbers on the far side of the garden and glance over to my house. I see the mystery girl standing by the swimming pool turned koi pond and instinctively yell out to her to call her over. Maybe she wants some fresh vegetables. She didn't respond, so I set the basket of cucumbers I'm holding down, dust myself off and start towards her. But she's already gone. I notice my family looking confused as to why I suddenly yell out, hey, but simply said I saw a friend drive by. It took a few seconds for me to realize this, but every time I'd seen her over the years, she was always wearing the same clothes. I found that odd, but decided it might just have been remembered incorrectly. I saw her once more that year, but that time may have been a dream, so I won't go into detail on that. Now we're in the present, well, technically three days ago, and I saw her again. After a long day of fencing a goat pen, I decided to head in the house and grab my pocket knife out of my room. I tried finding my knife earlier that day but gave up because I didn't really need it at the time. I went down the hallway, opened my bedroom door and turned on the light. And what I saw was terrifying, but strange enough for very long. She was sitting on my bed and just turned to look at me. 
She then did what was done almost every time I'd seen her, smile at me and calling wave. It looked like she thought the situation I had found myself in was perfectly normal and I found that incredibly soothing. I stood in my doorway for what felt like 15 seconds before I had the frame of mind to finally speak. What's your name? I asked her. Her lips appeared to have slightly moved, as if she was about to answer, but she didn't. Do you know me? I asked. She actually answered this time, and I swear I felt like I've heard her voice a million times. It just sounded unbelievably familiar. I'm not sure, but I think so. My dad opened the door and yelled to see what was talk taking me so long. So I turned to shout and tell him I'm still looking for my knife, which is totally believable because I lose it quite often. When I turned around, I'm saddened to see that she is no longer in the room with me, but the comforter on my bed clearly shows signs that someone has sat on it. I don't know what to do. If she is a ghost, then that would mean she's dead. If she's not a ghost, then what is she? Who is she? Why me? I have no idea who she is. All I know is, she's had a strange impact on me. When I see her, I feel an inexplicable sense of calm wash over me. And when I think of her, I just feel sad because she seems so lonely and lost. If she knows me, maybe we were friends in a past life. Or perhaps she's had me confused for someone else and is simply waiting on the wrong person to join her in the afterlife. If that's so, then what am I supposed to do? Anything? I've searched missing persons reports from my town and nearby, but turns out none of them match her appearance. Short but mildly curly blonde hair, bright pale but not too, too pale skin, slightly shorter than me. I'm 5'7 to 5'8. Orange tank top, short blue jean shorts, brown shoestring like belt, a silver necklace with a wolf head sticking in its tongue out, green eyes, and a bracelet with Kanji or Hansi characters on her right wrist. I've searched Facebook for a profile with her picture and found nothing. I know this probably sounds to many like complete bullshit and that's perfectly fine. I myself have never had any sort of ghost encounter before this. There was one time I heard someone whisper my name when I was trying to sleep, but I assumed that was one of my brothers trying to scare me. Another time in third grade, I woke up to find that I had a black eye. Most of my supernatural experiences are a result of my reoccurring sleep paralysis from which I've suffered for many years. But none of my encounters with this girl can be explained by sleep paralysis. They weren't dreams either. While I do have very realistic dreams in which I can smell, taste and feel everything and often have control of my actions, my dreams are almost always in third person perspective. And when I wake up, there's a clear distinction between my dreamscape and reality. The house that my mum used to live at for around five or six years was haunted horribly. We lived above a store and in our second year of living there, some people brought the store and turned it into a weave shop. Something we later found out was that there were drug deals going on down there and something else we couldn't figure out. We told the landlord about what was going on and he, the people pack up and move. Once they did, move we began to notice that there were voices and other types of sounds coming from the store area and eventually that began to come up to our area of the building. The weirdest encounter I've had with a spirit was when I do laundry in the basement below the shop and there would be this shadow cloaked man with a fedora hat on and he'd just kind of chill in the corner of the basement and just watch. If I ever acknowledge him then he'd just fade away into the shadows. After I moved to do school with my aunt in Georgia, my mum and brother would tell me that all the stuff that would occur while I was gone. We confirmed that demons do inhabit the building as well, as a little girl looking spirit, a man that looks to be from 1913, and a scary as fuck skinny grey thing that looks similar to SCP-096, but if you put long and untamed black hair on it. This story takes place quite a few years ago when I was turning six or seven. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, this was my first birthday party and I had invited some friends. We'll call them M, K, B and S for the purpose of this story. We had just gotten back to my house and I asked everyone what they wanted to do. S spoke up and said we should play Bloody Mary. 
I was pretty against the idea since I heard the story and didn't want some ghost in my bathroom. But since everyone else was down, I went along with the idea, though I refused to actually go in. So S, K and B all went into the main bathroom. The layout of my house was the main bathroom with a door leading into the hallway on the right and a sliding door leading to the parents' bedroom on the left. This will be important later. So M and I are sitting in the living room. I was huddled in a blanket because I was a wuss. We suddenly heard the others screaming and trying to open the door. I immediately ran to the hallway door, locked. I went to the parents' bathroom door, also locked. Did I forget to mention the hallway door couldn't lock and the sliding door was locked from the parents' bathroom? It couldn't be locked and then shut you had to lock it when it was closed. So I was freaking out and crying because I thought my friends were goners. What felt like the longest few seconds of my life passed by the hallway door was flung open and S, K and B almost tripped over themselves running out the bathroom. I was so relieved to see them and we all stood in the living room allowing them to catch their breath before explaining what happened. Things had started to calm down when S, whose back was facing the bathroom hallway at the time, started complaining about her back feeling like it was burning. We looked at each other before asking her to turn around so we can look at her back. We lift her shirt only to find an angry face starting to appear just under her right shoulder blade. The angry face looked freshly scratched and it was starting to bleed like someone with sharp fingernails had scratched her only moments earlier. What makes this even weirder is that none of us were near her back and she was the only person who had played the game multiple times with no consequences. That is where the story ends. Years later, M tried to tell me it was a prank, but I don't believe her. I remember it too well to even think it was faked. Their screams, the fear in their eyes, the mark on S and the fear I felt in that bathroom every time afterwards was enough to convince me it was real. As I said, I always felt something in that bathroom, especially when the lights were off. So I gained the habit of always opening the door before I flush and wash my hands. It was pretty funny telling my mom that, because she'd always wondered why I did that. When I was six or seven years old and I woke up one night, I'm not sure of the time, I just know that Leno was on. I saw what I thought was my brother standing on our dresser reaching for my Batman 1989 piggyback that came with the cereal. I was proud of it because it had $12 in it I'd been saving to buy a Ninja Turtle. I don't know what made me think it was my brother. We both have very dark brown hair, almost black, but whoever was on the dresser was blonde, was wearing pajamas neither of us owned and was internally glowing. Yeah, he was lit up in the dark room, but somehow wasn't casting any light. The room was totally dark. Anyway, I see this thing reaching for my bank, and I think it's my brother trying to steal my money. I say, Joe, go to sleep. I wait a couple seconds and say it again, and then again. On the third time, he turns and looks at me, still standing on the dresser. I get louder. Joe, go to sleep. Then I had it. I said, Joey, come on, go to sleep. As I removed my blanket and turned on the lamp, as soon as I turned the lamp on, it disappeared. I felt the blood leave my face. I let out a death scream and run downstairs to find my dad and brother watching TV, Leno. And I cry myself to sleep in my dad's arms, screaming about the ghost. That was the first and not the last time I've seen this stuff. This happened many years ago, as I was house shopping and recommend, recommended by my real estate agent to look at this new listing. The house was maybe 30 years old, ranch style, empty, clean, and in reasonably good shape, although it was dated in appearance. So we're walking around checking the bedrooms and talking about the price and condition. I have an odd feeling of being watched by someone, especially in the bedrooms, as if someone was standing close to my face. I usually don't have those vibes. We continued into the living room and kitchen area and the feeling continues, but more like being watched from a distance. I finally said to the agent, I feel like someone is watching us in here. I've been feeling it since about we walked in. Oh really? Hmm. As he looked around nervously. I paused for a few seconds to check my feelings. Did someone dying here? I can feel them. There's more than one. 
My Hispanic real agent, real agent turning ghost white. Yeah, how do you know? It was an elderly couple in a murder-suicide. It's them. The mom is in the bedroom, and the wife is watching us from the living room. I think it's best we leave them in peace. Never had that feeling before or since. I work in a print shop in North Central Arkansas. I believe it's haunted. Nothing demonic. Kinda fun and friendly. I wouldn't go as far as saying Casper. It pokes me on the shoulder when I look around, no one is there. I get to work 30 to 45 minutes sooner than the other three gents that work there. Pokes are not the only thing that happens. Oh no, lights will turn on or off. Doors will slowly open or close. Paper boxes will fall off shelves. Coffee aroma before I've even made coffee. My mom passed two and a half years ago, and before my dad took the recliner out one of the office room, we had the recliner locker would rock by itself. I'm not the only one who saw that. My daughter and co-worker did too. So my daughter and I had to go to work tonight to finish up a large project. I got up there first, about 15 minutes, to pull my daughter and her friend shut up. I was hearing some whispering going on in the back rooms of the print shop. I just froze because my daughter still hadn't gotten there, so I knew it wasn't her. She came walking through the door five minutes later. My daughter got there. We were working on our project and my daughter said, Hey mom, I just heard Papa's chair rolled across the floor. Is anyone else here? I was too chicken to go up and check the situation out. So she did. She grabs Papa's chair and sits in it to do her job. Ten minutes ago, she's seen the shadow by the back door. Keep in mind, me, my daughter and her friend are the only people here. Then we hear a big bang like someone dropped something in the office, but it was near the front of the office where it was all dark. We hurried up and finished our project so we could go home. This only happens in the evening hours. When I get there in the morning before anyone else, I don't have this problem of feeling like people are watching me. I don't hear noises too much, if any at all. I don't have this overwhelming sense of darkness or doom when I'm in there in the morning hours. I just don't know why it only happens at night. It wasn't like it was dark outside yet. It was 7.30 in the evening, no darker outside than it was 7.30 in the morning. It's the same amount of light pouring in the office. <laughs>